Hi everyone, Dom Famulara back again. This, this just seems to get better and better because I get the chance to step into the mind and the lives of these great, great musicians. Alice in Chains, I love the band. It is intense, it is hardcore, it's in your face. And I've got with me, William Duvall. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, it's good to be here. William, I, I got to say, man, you, you sing and you play, you, you really have a, a, an edge to yourself that really is exciting that when you're on stage or even on the recording, you can hear your presence kind of like in your face. <laughs> it really is great to have that level of presence. Where do you think this all came from? I know, you, you know, you, going back to the beginning, when did music and or even guitar enter your life? Eight years old, I had an older cousin, 10 years older. So I was eight, he was 18. My cousin Donald, and he moved in with my mother and me when we were living in Washington, D.C., in Southwest. You know, he kind of had a little bit of a troubled home life, and he was at that age where it was like, you know, uh, could go one way or the other. So he, he, my mother thought she could help, and uh, he came in, and he brought his little record collection with him. And in that record collection were things like uh, Santana, Abraxas, Roy Ayers, Weather Report, and the one that really caught my attention was Hendrix Band of Gypsies. And so one day he put that record on. And mind you, it was a really old scratchy copy. You know, <laughs> this was 76, you know, but the record hadn't been taken care of very well. So it was warped and it was doing this on the turntable. And we had to put a little weight on my little, uh, my little uh, show and tell record player <laughs> to keep the needle down. But the music really caught me. And I immediately started just bombarding Donald with questions about like, what is making that sound? How is he doing that? That's a guitar, like what's going on? And he would answer the questions. He was really great. And Donald was what I would call an ecstatic listener. Mm -hmm. like, he really loved listening to music. So if Hendrix would play a certain phrase, it was super amazing. Donald would, did you hear that? Whoa, did you hear that? And he'd run the record back and it didn't matter how many times he had heard it before. You know, he would he would run it back the same way and and he would call, he would sing it out loud to me and then he would run it back on the record. And it just taught me so much about the messages in the notes and in the phrases and gave me a real appreciation for listening to what was going on in the background as well. You know, like any little like percussion thing on a weather report record, he would just did you hear what he did there? You know, that little cowboy thing. That was my life for about two years. Hmm. And, you know, I had already uh, discovered an old battered acoustic guitar, a, sort of a, a nylon string acoustic in my grandmother's basement. And I'd already begun sort of plucking around on that a little bit. But when Donald moved in and I heard Hendrix and I heard all these other amazing records that he had, I mean, Funkadelic, it really was the, the spark that lit the fire. And I got serious. So in early 77, when I'd been playing for not quite a year, but I was starting to get proficient enough on the beat up nylon, <laughs> Donald joined the Navy. And with his first paycheck from the Navy, he bought me my first electric guitar, which was a Fender Mustang, brand new 77 Fender Mustang. Oh. And, uh, and he taught me how to wire it through the stereo so I could play along with the records because I didn't have an amp yet. And uh, that was, that's what got me going, yeah. Well, William, what a beautiful story. And you know, your mother is, should be up for sainthood. <laughs> for bringing your cousin Donald into the picture Indeed. and giving him direction in life, but also the yeah. fact that that was the seed that planted music inside of you. I mean, listen, Weather Report, Santana, and Hendrix. It doesn't get any better than that. At a young age, to be that influenced by that higher quality of music, that every single note that they play is inspirational. So yeah. here you are gathering this music. It's in your head now. You're living with this. When did you start playing with other musicians? That would have been around 13 or 14. I, so for the first, you know, five, six years that I played, it was, you know, bedroom jamming along with records. I started record collecting hardcore, you know, from, from that period where Donald was living with us up to today. And so, um, I, you know, I started collecting records, playing along with those records. And then right around 13, 14, uh, you know, was when, I would I first started, you know, occasionally inviting other kids to the house and we would try to play a little something or I'd go over to somebody else's house and we'd try to play a little something. But it really got serious for me when punk rock came into the picture. 
you know, and that was, again, that was around 13 or 14, but in Washington and in the Washington area where I lived, I actually moved from DC to Columbia, Maryland, a little suburb of, yeah. of Washington, in spite of the fact that I would, I was, I was just beginning to find out that one of the greatest hardcore punk scenes in the world was right in my backyard in the Washington area with Discord Records and all the great bands. I wasn't able to get other kids to, you know, form such a band with me, you know. And then I got the news that uh, we were moving to Atlanta. So <laughs> my, my uh, stepfather got a promotion in his job. And uh, so we were, it's like, well, we're gone. And this is, you know, 14 years old, you, know, you have friends, you're just starting the, the, you know, you're coming out of middle school into high school. It's a crucial age. And I'm just starting to want to go out and play with other, other kids. And it's like, we're pulling up stakes. We got to go. And when we landed in Atlanta in uh, summer of 82, there wasn't much going on in terms of punk influence music and there was nothing going on in terms of hardcore. So I had to kind of become, uh, you know, I had to break out the machete and start hacking through the <laughs> wilderness <laughs> to, to start making stuff happen. That was when it got more serious with, with playing with other musicians because my thing was I wanted to write my own songs the small amount of playing with other kids in, in the Washington area that I did involved, you know, a kid coming over who kind of plays guitar too, and you're going to try to play along with the, the latest Cars record or something. I went and saw the film, The Decline of Western Civilization, when it came to Washington in 81. Yeah. And, I, and it's the funniest thing. I, I begged my grandfather, of all people, to take me to see this, this movie about the L.A. punk scene. And we <laughs> go to this theater in DuPont Circle, we're sitting there and watching all this chaos go on on the screen, you know, people <laughs> slam dancing and stuff. I mean, in, in 81, most people didn't even know what that was, slam dancing. <laughs> but, and, and, and the music was really despised by, you know, figures of authority. So, I mean, they thought, you know, the children have lost their minds. And <laughs> there's my grandfather and 13 year old me sitting there watching this insane film. But, um, and, when, and when we came out, all he could say was like, well, I haven't seen everything now, Hoss. But, uh, but, but the thing was, Black Flag was in that movie. And, yeah. and they're one of the first bands that appears in the film playing. And, and Greg Ginn became a huge inspiration, kind of an epiphany in the same way Hendrix was, is what he was doing. I mean, it sounds chaotic and everything, but there actually was a method to the madness. And, and by that time, I had started, um, like I said, I was collecting records. So I had all kinds of records in my collection. So it would go from Funkadelic to Prince to Ornette Coleman to John Coltrane to the Stooges to the MC5 to Albert Eiler to, you know, Chic, you know, with Nile Rodgers. And, and of course, my mainstay, Hendrix, you know, and, and, and the classics from when I was little, like Stevie Wonder and Earth, Wind and & Fire and so on. So I had a huge appetite and a, and a huge collection forming. And when I heard Black Flag and what Ginn was doing, it kind of reminded me of free jazz a little bit. And it also had obviously ties to what, you know, James Williamson and Ron Ashton were doing in the Stooges. So I took to it like a fish to water, just like Hendrix was the spark that inspired me to want to play the guitar. Greg Ginn and Black Flag were the spark that inspired me to want to form a band and write my own things. I mean, when you think about the wide variety of music you were taking in, I mean, that really is an incredible open mind to start taking in all this from free jazz to like to earth, wind and fire to, I mean, this is really, you know, this is really an amazing yeah. span of listening. I was a strange kid, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I was, an, I was at 11 years old, I, I asked for and received a subscription to musician, player and listener magazine. You remember that magazine? Yeah, that I sure do, yeah. In the late yeah. 70s, early 80s. That was a great magazine. and and. The very first issue that I received, it was, a, it was a Christmas present. So I started receiving my first issues, like sort of the end of the year, beginning of the following year, like this would have been 79 or so. And the first issue I got had Funkadelic or George Clinton and Sun Ra sharing the cover. The next <laughs> issue I got, I think had Brian Eno, but it wasn't just about the cover stories. It was about the features within the magazine and the record reviews and the, you know, it was, it really was cover to cover, very, very informative. And the, and the level of the quality of the writing was so good. You had some 
I would say that was like the golden or maybe toward the end of the golden era of music journalism, you know, yeah. that started in the sixties where you had inspired writing by guys like Lester Bangs and, and Chip Stern and, and so many others. I kind of started at the top in many ways in, in terms of my education because Hendrix was the first guy I really was listening to play guitar and he's still the very best in my opinion. Absolutely. And then, you know, a magazine like musician, player and listener, you know, turning me on to all these different things. It was an incredible uh, kind of watershed moment. And I would go out and I'd find the records and a lot of them were really hard to find, you know, but I was that kid that was saying like, for my birthday, hey, can you get me Tales of Captain Black, you know, by Ornette Coleman and Blood Omer. And, you know, and I had cousins in New York and they would go to the, you know, Bleaker Bob's and yeah. the village or whatever, and they would find it and they'd bring it down to me in, in DC, you know. And so by the time I got to Atlanta at 14, I had a lot going on and wanted to start applying it. And that's, you know, again, where I started forming my first bands. And, and they were hardcore bands, but it was infused with a lot, all of this other music as well, you know? But I think what's amazing is that you allowed all these, you know, these influences to kind of come into you. So w when did Awareness of Void of Chaos come in? When, when did that kind of start? That was, eight, that, was, that was like late summer 82. That was the first real band I got together. And it was, you know, I, they enrolled me in the local high school. <laughs> Uh, in, in Decatur, Georgia. And, uh, you know, uh, probably not surprisingly, I, I was not very well accepted by, <laughs> by, by the population there. And, you know, it, I was, like I said, I, I, I wasn't like a lot of other kids. And, and so there weren't many people there that would give me the time of day, you know? And, but two of the kids that would, the only two that would, <laughs> <laughs> were uh, Ricky Jackson, who was the drummer in the marching band. He played the snare drum in the marching band. And Roger Maynard, who played no instrument at all, but who was a cool kid. And he kind of uh, got along with a lot of different cliques. He got along with the jocks. He got along with the stoners. He was a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. And he was affable enough. And he was a good looking kid too. So that helped him with the girls and everything. And these kids lived in the neighborhood. And, and so they were literally like a street over from me. And I started just like, you know, I, I just convinced those guys like, come over to my house. I want to, you know, play you some stuff, you know? And, and, and so I would play them my own songs. And then I would also play them the, the singles that I had, the 45 singles I had by Black Flag. And, and the, the, there were a few albums by that time in the, what, what you would, I guess, the so-called hardcore punk genre. So I would, I would play the few albums that were out by then. I think, I think Black Flag had damaged out by then. So I'd play in the singles by then, the album. Then there was a Roar cassette, a company called Roar, Reach Out International Records. They put out a cassette, they were a cassette only label. And they put out a lot of really cool tapes that weren't, weren't, weren't out on any other format. Uh, and the one that was probably the best known and most amazing was the, the Bad Brains, the first uh, Bad Brains yeah. proper album, I guess you'd call it. These were four black guys from Washington, D.C., just like me, who were jazz fusion musicians before they ever heard punk. Mm -hmm. And then they applied their musicianship to the energy of punk. And they just ran the table. They were the best. They were the best band in the genre. One of the best bands in any genre. To this day, the best live band I've ever seen. So I had this cassette and I was like, and check this out, man. You know, these guys are brothers too. And look, they play this, they, cause you know, people had this misconception, you know, oh, you know, rock is white people music or, and punk rock, especially. It was like, that's, that's white people music. That's crazy white boy music. You know what I mean? Like they stick themselves with pins and they vomit on stuff. I and mean, you know, they're just like, I don't want to deal with that. But here was a band, the Bad Brains who were, they ran counter to all of that. They could, and, and the, other, the other thing was, oh, and those guys can't play. So again, the Bad Brains, they gave the lie to all of it. It was like, these were conscious guys. They were getting into Rastafarianism. Yeah. They were devout and they could play better than anybody. And like, like, so it was just like, whoa, wow, you know? And they played reggae music as well. So they, they had a diversification to their whole sound and 
with that inspiration, those guys agreed to, to join this band that I was trying to get together. And, and we, they play my stuff and we started getting gigs. I, I, you know, we used to record our demo tapes on a boom box with one microphone. And uh, <laughs> we practiced most of the time in Ricky Jackson's house because he was a drummer. You know, that's that's how it goes. Right. You you probably know. <laughs> and, uh, and so so we set up we set up at his house and um, we used to play with, with the, the band, the amps and the drums were in one room. And then I would stand in this room, in, like the laundry room with the door <laughs> separating us. And we'd leave the door open just to crack, you know, and, I, and the one microphone would be situated in front of me. It was like a cheap Radio Shack mic you know, that I taped to a stand and that one mic would pick up everything. So I would scream into that mic because I wouldn't call it singing. I was trying to sound like Des Kadena from Black Flag back then. I'd scream into the mic and, we, you know, we'd play our, you know, tornado of tunes. And then I took that, that demo tape and went downtown, caught the bus downtown to the one club that had sort of left of center kind of music that would host, you know, the, the one club in Atlanta that would host like Iggy Pop when he would come through town or, or yeah. you know, kind of the, the new wave bands that would come through town. And that would, that club was 688. And, and uh, I went to the manager of 688, Steve May, and, and, and uh, God love him, he, he, he gave us a shot. And, <laughs> and that was the beginning of gigging. That really is amazing when you think about just the, the sheer perseverance that you had to organize this all and just the, I, I guess we got to talk about fate, you know, the fate from 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 your mom to your cousin to the move to Atlanta to meeting these musicians. There really was this, you know, synchronicity of you finding people that were like minded people. Yeah. That were making things happen. Yeah, that was that was really lucky. And I tell you, when 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 AVOC, when Awareness Void of Chaos started gigging in Atlanta, it opened the floodgates of what you just described, the, the, the like minded people because that was the difficult thing about Atlanta. The scene was just starting. We yeah. were starting it. The hardcore scene is, is uh, distinguished by the youth. Right. I mean, punk rock up until that point was still young adult music for the most part. There, right. there were some teenagers involved for sure, but, but it, was still, it was still mostly young adult music and, and it was governed by the major label system to a large extent. You know, the Sex Pistols got signed to EMI and then Virgin. The Ramones right. were on Sire Records. When hardcore came along, it was youth driven. Like we're talking 15 and 16 year olds like me right. were starting their own fanzines and they were putting out their own records. They were starting labels. They were booking tours, booking their own tours. When AVOC started gigging in downtown Atlanta, that's when I started meeting other kids my age. They didn't really know what they were into yet, but they liked the energy of the music. And together with those kids, we really started the hardcore scene in Atlanta. And AVOC uh, broke up the following summer in 83. But by then, I'd met some of these other kids and, and I started recruiting out of that pool of that small but dedicated pool of kids. And that's where I formed Neon Christ because I found I, I started meeting those kids. There was a there was a club that started again talk about fate destiny whatever the the metroplex was a club that was also downtown started and that club was all ages yeah. 688 was not all ages yeah. so if if my band aboc was not on the bill of a particular concert i couldn't go unless my mother took me you know <laughs> which which she did to her credit sometimes but for the most part i wasn't allowed to even be on the premises at 688 we started hearing rumors about this other club that's starting like a block or two over uh, on Lucky Street called the Metroplex and immediately made a beeline over there. And that's where the scene really took fire, you know, because we had a place to go. So with, with, with Neon Christ, you put this together now, you're starting to perform, you're getting a name for yourself. It seems like the music now is starting to get a little bit more formulated. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I found people who are willing to play every day. Right. That was the key, you know, a good band, you know, they, they have to practice as much as possible. And for me, that meant all the time <laughs> that meant certainly every day, hours a day. And then you, ha you have to gig. We were able to do both. It sort of becomes a, there's a bit of a snowball effect because 
Um, I was writing all the time and I had an outlet for these new songs as they came to me. I had a band to play them and we were grinding them out all the time. And so that feeds new inspiration. And, uh, and then when we started playing gigs, now the audience joins the party. It's like, now you're getting, in from, you're getting inspiration through the immediate feedback of these shows. And these shows were taking place in, you know, storefront uh, spaces. You know, the Metroplex really, was, it, it was a community center before it was, you know, it, these clubs were not like nightclubs the way most people think of them. They, right. These were makeshift spaces. You know, they were intimate affairs. I mean, and you, you, you start developing this very small audience for a brand new music that's on the cutting edge of everything that's happening, right. you know, that would go on to influence the entire culture, the world culture. I mean, again, in, you know, 1980, 81, no one knew what slam dancing was. Now you can't go to a right. mainstream big time rock show that's a high energy band playing without moshing, moshing, you know? The term moshing, that's, I, the Bad Brains really, I think, came up with that term. Like, I, I credit them with that. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, cause they, they were trying to, you know, they would sometimes slip into a Jamaican patois and even though they were, you know, you know brothers from DC, they would, they'd, you know, they'd smoke a little bit and they'd slip into a little patois, you know, and, 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 and the Jamaicans, they have this expression about, you know, mashing it up, like having fun, mashing it up, but they would say mosh, you know, mosh it up, man. And so the Bad Brains, you know, they used to have this thing in their music where they'd be playing really, really fast, really, really fast, hectic, 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 and then it would break down into this kind of like almost like metal part. And it would do it, would, it would, and once it did that, man, the audience would go, I mean, if they were going berserk before, now, now it was like putting lighter fluid on it. <laughs> and, the, 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 and they, and it, it started, you would normally call that part a breakdown part, but you know, just the, the lexicon developed to where it became the mosh part of the song. <laughs> and so the, the dance was given the name moshing. And so anyway, I say that I'll say this was newly emerging culture in Atlanta, we were on the front lines of it, and we took everything that came with that, the, 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 the good and the bad <laughs> that came with that. But the point is, it was a constantly inspiring environment to play in and to also grow up in. To this day, I'm largely governed by the work ethic, the values, the principles that I developed then, you know, so it... You know, let's, yeah. let's talk. Let's talk about that because this is really intriguing, William. Because the you mentioned work ethic and you mentioned the principles and you mentioned the the hard work. That's got to be a part of the mixture of all this here. And I want the younger generation, as they're as they're listening to this, to understand that that never changes. That's right. got to be the fundamental foundation of what you focus on to be able to sing as great as you sing, to play guitar, and to write as well as you've written with all this inspiration. That's got to be a part of the ingredients. Absolutely, it does. Where do you think um, that came from? Well, for me, you know, again, it came from punk rock. Again, no one was interested in this music we were playing in terms of com the commercial music industry. Right. No one wanted anything to do with it. Right. Um, so if you wanted to make a record, you had to do it. And again, no regular rock club is going to book a band like, like yours. So if you want to play a, a show, you have to figure it out. If you want to do a tour, you have to figure it out. Right. And, you know, so a whole network of kids developed around the nation and around the world, an underground network. And again, this is pre-internet. So, you know, <laughs> if you were striking out on the road, a lot of times it was because of a phone number that you copied out of somebody else's notebook, you know, because you heard a rumor that there's someone in Richmond, Virginia is putting on shows. There's someone in Raleigh, North Carolina is putting on shows. And, you'd call that number and you'd have to wait until you finally got someone on the line and hopefully you found the right person and then you, they arrange a show. And then it's just, you hope it actually happens when you get to town on the appointed day. And most of the time it did happen. And most of the time you'd find a place to stay among the other kids. They, they you know, you, cause you couldn't afford hotels. You're lucky to make, you know, $50 for the show. And so this kind of network fueled the entire scene. It fueled the culture. And again, it teaches you about work. It teaches you about commitment. Um, and uh, you just, it stays with you. And I, I also would say that um, the SST guys, the, the Black Flag guys, they, they 
they were really inspirational in that regard too, because they were older. These were guys, you know, Greg Ginn, uh, you know, he had a, he had a business degree before he ever even picked up a yeah. guitar. You smart know? guy. Yeah. Smart and, guy. Yeah. And so, you know, so he took that acumen and started SST records. And when I was a teenager, that label SST blossomed into the underground label of the era. He had a lot of committed people working with him. And I got a window into their inner life because I got to know, I mean, that was the thing about punk. You, you could know your heroes, you know, you could, they, they weren't these remote rock stars living in a mansion somewhere. These were guys pulling up in a van, loading their own gear into the space to play the show. And then afterward they're loading it out and they're getting in and they're driving, you know, 500 miles to the next show, you know? And so when I got to know those guys, Sometimes I would even stay with them, uh, you know, in their office space uh, in L.A. And they were usually in the suburbs of L.A., like Lawndale or Long Beach or whatever. But seeing how they work, those guys, a lot of them didn't have anywhere to live that you'd call a proper residence. They didn't have apartments or houses. They lived in the office. They'd sleep under the desk at night. You know, for a shower, they might go to the, the, the gas station or something, you know, and hose off. You know what I mean? Like it was. But they were running that label. The phones were always working. You know what I mean? The lights were always on and there were always records getting churned out. And there was always a band practicing in the, in the practice space. The office doubled as a practice space. Their entire focus went to that work. It went to playing the music and it went to putting out the records and that was it. All other creature comforts, like, you know, food, you know, things like that, took a back seat. And I got to see that up close. And it was, um, again, it was really, it set the bar high. It's like, yeah. if, you, if you really want to get serious about what you're doing, this is the level of commitment you have to have. And again, it mirrors what I saw when I started to getting, getting to know a lot of my favorite jazz musicians, particularly the ones in the more out jazz kind of thing. You know, They had a similar drive and a similar work ethic with little in terms of, what you would typically call rewards, you know, their reward was in the work itself. Absolutely. These guys weren't making any money. A lot of them were lucky to have any place to live at all. And they were lucky to get gigs when they could, you know, well, I mean, I'm, ta I'm not talking about the Miles Davises of the world, like where right. you're, you're, you're like a superstar in the genre. I'm talking about guys like Henry Threadgill, Dewey Redman, guys like Sonny Murray. These guys live very close to the ground and, and, and it was all about the work. But, you know, I, I think a lot of the early jazz players, which is where a lot of this collaborative passion started, Listen, even going back to Art Blakey and these people, the jazz masters, these guys really struggled because the cause was the music. Yeah. It wasn't fame. See, that's where we're a little bit, we're a little bit confused now with the internet now and all the social media stuff. Fame and, and being well known seems to be taking a priority as opposed to what you were doing, which was always the quality of the music, and getting out there and just building up a, a clientele of listeners that would yeah. support what you were doing. That was brilliant. Yeah. The work is its own reward. Whether, whether you're talking about the music itself, playing the music, writing the music, or whether you're talking about putting out the records and building and feeding your own little grassroots infrastructure, that becomes part of the art right. as well. For the, like the SST guys, they'd spend a whole day just on the phone with distributors you know, on the phone with college radio stations, you know, when the label really started humming and they started getting good reviews and in, 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 in mainstream magazines like Rolling Stone getting a four star review for the, the Meat Puppets album or whatever. Like these guys were on the phone working full days, you know, arranging tours on the phone with promoters, on the phone with distributors, on the phone with college radio program directors. And then they go and pull a four hour practice. You know, <laughs> but it's all one thing to them. You know, it's like you're making it happen or you're not. That's it. And there's no excuses. You're doing it or you're not doing it. It's, it's right. almost kind of a zealotry or a, like a militaristic kind of thing. That's what I saw. That's what I learned. I saw the results of it and I couldn't deny it. The whole space cadet with a guitar thing had to go. It was like that ain't going to make it anymore. You know. Yeah. For some people who get extremely lucky, win the lottery, you know, maybe they can make that work, at least for a while. Yeah. But if you really want to do it for real and you don't want to be dependent on as much on just, you know, the fates or, you know, some 
some money bags uh, person or company to discover you, you know, and then probably rip you off blind, you know, but like, if you don't want to, if you don't want to, you know, be at the will of the wind, so to speak, if you want to kind of create your own, your own, like carve your own path and, and be more in control of it, this is the tack you have to take. There really is no other way. Well, that, that really, that, that's, that's really fantastic advice. I mean, it really, really is. And you, you, you really have this way of, you know, you really are focused at what you wanted and you're, you're probably even more focused now of what you're doing. So yeah. that, that's a, that probably comes with a skill that you've learned in time, how to fine tune that focus. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely true. It's something that you can carry with you all through life. Right. That's the beauty of it. You know, certain things age better than others. You know what I mean? Like the, again, the whole uh, space cadet with a guitar, like, you know, young and glamorous, like, you know, just, I don't even know what day it is, you know, that kind of thing. That works when you're 20, 25, you know right. what I mean? Right. If you get much beyond that, it doesn't play as well. It just doesn't play as well. And yeah. especially if you haven't been lucky enough to make several fortunes, you know what I mean? Over, you know, like, like several times over, you know, right. if you haven't been lucky enough to keep winning the lottery over and over again, you know, <laughs> and, and if you haven't been lucky enough to, to, have somebody looking out for you to manage your, your, your money and, you know, keep you kind of together, you know, and tell you it's Wednesday when you need to know or whatever. If you're not that, that, that one tenth of 1% or that one thousandth of 1%, yeah. then you better, you know, you better figure out another path. And, and this path, at least you can keep on, keep on, keep on as long as you want, you know, as long as you want. Um, because it, it's it's a um, because then you're a self starter, you're a self starter. Mm. You can channel it in whatever direction you want. You know, if you really like, if I might one day say like, oh, you know, I, I'm I'm not feeling as uh, inspired as a musician now. I'm gonna just concentrate on the label. You know, mm. like because I I run my own label for for gosh, almost 25 years now, and you know, some years are more active in one area or another. Some years it's a heavy touring year for Alice in Chains or something. And I've got to go and, and you know, concentrate more on that. Um, but again, the discipline follows me into every dressing room, in every town, in, you know, it follows me into every hotel and every stage and every time zone of every country that we play. So the discipline doesn't change. I have my routine every day for Alice in Chains shows. And then days like today, where it's more of a, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to get out a new, uh, my second solo album out by June. So the focus lately has been all hands on deck with that, the infrastructural apparatus of that record coming out in June. And also the, the, the European tour, the UK European solo tour yeah. that has been postponed four times now since 2020. Now yeah. it looks like it's a go finally in, uh, in uh, April and May. Uh, so I'm, it's all hands on deck, getting, getting both of those things up and running. Same discipline. It's like I might, I, I happen to be kind of in my sort of office right now. Yeah. So right here at arm's length is the desk. I'm sitting in the same chair that I sit in, whether I'm writing a, a new song or whether I am emailing with record pressing plants and, you know, and distributors and, you know, and, and, and promoter and the tour manager and the, you know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. same chair, same room, same desk, same guitar sitting by my side with a couple of acoustics right here out of view, and same discipline, you know? Boy, this, but this is such an important point that I want the message to be heard loud and clearly. Self-discipline means basically self-control. We have to make that happen within ourselves to make it happen. So here you are balancing Listen, you're singing, you're writing, you're playing guitar, you got Alice in Chains happening, you've got your own record label. How do you balance all that? And then on top of that, try to have a life in between that. Yeah, it's really tough uh, sometimes. There, there, most days, it doesn't feel like there are enough hours in yeah. a day. Yeah. Um, and particularly once I became a parent, um, that it really got challenging because on the one hand, your entire reason for living and working in, and, and, and a lot of the, uh, the 
purpose for the work that you do shifts because yeah. now it's not just about you anymore. And in a way, everything you do, uh, at least in my case, is for <laughs> is for this other little person. Um, and uh, and you want to be present for for that child. You want to be you want to be present. And so um, the good news is I don't work at say you know an insurance company or you know some sort of uh, you know um, nine to five a, a corporate banking institution or whatever or yeah you know a nine to five or 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 um, an executive job that even demands more than nine to five but the company's not mine right you know maybe maybe I'm high up in the company I'm making a, a lot of dough but my time is not my own. And other than maybe some stock options that I might have in the, in the larger company, right. the company's not mine either. You know, right. in, in my case, again, it's, it's, uh, it's more self-driven. So I have a little bit more leeway if, if I'm sitting here working and, you know, toiling away at the computer on something or, uh, you know, and then my son comes in and wants to play ball or he wants to do, you know, he needs to be driven to soccer practice or yeah. I, I do all of that and then I get back to my work. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so sometimes it might mean that I work a 20 hour day and, you know, and I'm lucky to get four hours sleep because I got to be up in the morning, take them to school or whatever, and then yeah. get right back into it. The ball is more in my court. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yes. Absolutely. In all things. Also in, in, in my opinion, anyway, the reward is better for me, at least in terms of what I consider rewards, um, you know, my, my label is, is not, you know, Warner brothers records or anything like that, but every release is like a victory. Every album that comes out is enough. Like, wow, we made it again. You know, we did it. You know what I mean? It's like every copy sold of any of the records is a victory. Any order that comes in gets shipped out. It, there's just such a, a level of satisfaction with it. Your definition of success, it has to adjust to whatever's really going to work for you. You know what I mean? It has to be defined. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It has to be defined. And, and, and again, who better than you to define it for yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it seems like you have defined it and you really understand that there's a, each one of these steps, whether it's one unit being sold is a feeling of gratitude that your effort right. made this happen with your vision. You put your vision into the universe and people are responding. This yeah. is huge success. Yeah, it is. I had my first taste of that when I was 16 years old, Neon Christ. When our little 45 record, 10 songs jammed onto it. <laughs> when that came back from the pressing plant, it was just a moment of awe. It was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, you know, this is us pressed into the grooves of a record and you put it on the return table and you hear yourself and it's like, whoa, you know, and any bones of contention or, or <laughs> problems that I might have with my performance on this or, or the sound of this or that or whatever, or, oh, I kind of wish I'd done that better was totally subsumed by the fact that the thing just existed. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. like, oh my gosh. And then people start buying it. You know, we start, you know, we start getting mail orders from all over the world, you know, broken English letter, hand scrawl letters, you know, <laughs> saying, you know, from, from Czechoslovakia or, you know, France or, or, you know, Japan, like with often with the currency, the local currency falling yeah. out of the envelope, you know, because yeah. our, our record was two dollars and fifty cents. But these people would send yen. They'd send francs. This is before the unification of all these things. You know, so every country had their own currency. And again, we're talking about handwritten letters. We're not talking about emails or anything involving computer or anything. That was deeply satisfying as a teenager to have that happen. And, and same with you show up to a town where you didn't know anybody and you yeah. play for a little handful of kids. It might be 30, it might be 50, it might be a hundred, but wow, you know, like this is incredible. I had to develop alternative definitions for success. Success was not just, you know, I'm, I'm sprawled out on my round bed in my mansion. You know what I mean? Right. Success could mean so many different things. 
And again, I was lucky to have found uh, a little niche for myself where I could learn that. I could learn it hands on and take that into later life because again, for most of my life, you know, the mainstream music industry was not interested in the music I was playing at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I might have been five years ahead of the curve, 10 years ahead of the curve, in, in some cases, depending on what band, what era, what time period we're talking about. But it, that's been the story of my life. So I learned early on that if, you know, if you don't document it yourself, right. you are more than likely going to be waiting for the rest of your life. You're going to be waiting forever. The moment will pass, it will go undocumented, and it will be as though it never happened. And, and so learning that early and then having that lesson repeated for me all through my life has been very useful. It hasn't always been easy. And t- at times it's been excruciatingly difficult. Yeah. And especially when I was a younger guy and, you know, you want the, you, you want the glories that come along with, you know, certain material success. Also, I was watching people that I knew personally go on to such success. You know, I mean, when, you know, the Black Crows first hit, you know, we're about the same age. And so those guys, I remember them. I remember them when they were sneaking downtown from, from their suburb, you know, their, their parents' house north of Atlanta to try to sneak into Neon Christ shows. <laughs> and I remember when they formed Mr. Crow's Garden and it, they sounded like kind of a, you know, an REM knockoff band. Yeah. And then I remembered when they disappeared for a little while, no one knew where they went, or maybe I'm sure their friends knew where they went, but then suddenly they reemerge with a new name, the Black Crows, yeah. and a record out on Rick Rubin's label. Yeah. And the next thing you know, they're everywhere. And, yeah. you know, I saw that and it was like, wow, look at those guys, you know, and, and, and this was just one of many examples where people that I knew either personally or peripherally were going on and doing these things and doing these things and making it happen. And, and this was back when, you know, if you got on MTV, man, you were, you know, that was, that was your, that was your, your, your ticket. You know what I mean? That was your, that was your express train to the promised land. And, you know, and, you know, seeing that and then, and then it's like, okay, well, what I'm doing is not a part of that, you know? And, and, you know, having to, again, just kind of, um, constantly evaluate your perspective about what you what what the work means to you what you really really want out of the work and out of life looking back now i i can't imagine a much better path yeah for 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 the whole like the whole way it's developed the whole story the whole trajectory and especially now i'm at an age i can appreciate everything even the hardships through all the years. And I can also shed light on things from my past, work from my past. I can bring some attention to it uh, that it wouldn't have had, that it never had then, and that it, that, you know, that it wouldn't have under any other circumstances. So yeah, that's, well, that's really cool. There's something about age and maturity that seems to find uh, a balance in all of this, which you have done so well, but even from going back to, to from Dion Farris and I know when you co-wrote that to even your your next solo album that you're producing now, it seems like you've been pretty much fine-tuned to be very very aware of how you wanted to perceive your image, your sound, and the marketing and the planting the seed of every note you play. You seem to be really focused on that, which is absolutely totally impressive. Thanks again lessons, uh, you know, hard, hard won lessons, you know, um, because it's one thing to be a teenager in neon Christ and you're still, you know, for the most part, you know, you're, you're, you know, everyone's living in their parents' house and, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, a, a really cool, really left of center, um, kind of art project that you're doing, you know, and, and it's all good. But when you, want to make the transition into, okay, now how am I going to make music my living for real? That's when the rubber really meets the road. That's, <laughs> that's where it gets really challenging. 
And especially if, um, you know, maybe your tastes are a bit more wide screen than, yeah. than, than average, you know, your, your desire to reflect that is maybe a little stronger than others. That's when it gets really interesting. And, and again, there were challenging times, um, you know, but I managed to make a way. Uh, I think around the time of, of the Dion Ferris record, that was a real learning curve because um, my association with, with, with that whole thing was born out of the absolute heartbreak that I felt mm-hmm. over the way my band No Walls was treated. Right. You know, from 88 to, to 1988 to 92, I had this band No Walls that at the time I was convinced was the, the logical future of rock. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I was convinced. I felt like what we were doing incorporated so many elements from the 60s to by then the late 80s that it's like if you were going to take everything that happened and you were going to continue on that same trajectory that like Hendrix was on and that and that uh, you know Miles Davis was on and that Joni Mitchell was on and and that some of the the more modern bands of the era like Sonic Youth what they were on like what would that sound like, yeah. you know, like, and it wasn't that we sat there and formulated it like a, like a chemist or anything. It just was who, who I was. And then I found these, these, these jazz musicians to play with. That was just naturally who I was and who we were as a band, but it was not what the industry wanted at right. all. Right. And right. so despite the fact that we had, you know, a guy like Vernon Reed just, virtually becoming our patron. Living Color at that time in 88, 89, 90, 91, they were one of the hottest bands in the world. You know, they, they were on the cover of Rolling Stone. They were they were opening for the Stones on tour. Um, they were selling out theaters on their own. They were on MTV, heavy rotation, you know, oh. the, 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 the ticket to, you know, again, the, 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 the express train to the promised land. They were on it. You know, Vernon kind of being the, the leader of that band, taking an interest in what I was doing and becoming a, a close friend of mine to this day was was great. Having a guy like David Frick, who was the the, the senior editor at Rolling Stone at the time, coming down and, and, and loving what we were doing and writing about us in Rolling Stone. Um, in fact, we're mentioned in the cover story Living Color had in Rolling Stone magazine. We're mentioned because he came down to CBGB's and saw us and was like, whoa. But it didn't translate to the A&R guys who were coming from every label. They, you know, Vernon could, could bring down all kinds of people to, you know, to see us, but then they'd have to see it and they didn't see it. Yeah. You know, and well, at they, 22, they, 23 years old, that's, that's crushing, you know, cause I'm, I'm convinced at that point, you know, I was still convinced like, Oh, you know, the good guys win. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, but wait, uh, wait, aren't we, aren't we, isn't, isn't it supposed to be about advancing the thing? I mean, aren't we supposed to be moving the ball down the field? What's happening here? You know, like I didn't, you know, it's still that, that, that last bit of naivete or whatever, but, but that's when I learned. It's like, no, you know, the, the good guy doesn't always win. And if you, and if you wait to be rescued, <laughs> yeah. That's, an interesting line. That's a very interesting line. If you wait to be rescued, the <laughs> ship's not going to come to the shore. You're going to have to row out at some point to get to that ship. But you've always seemed to have been ahead of the curve. You've always been ahead of the musical genre creation. You've always been at this battling this newer concept, which has been a, a style that you have, which I want you to continue because you're really pushing the edge. Let me ask in closing, we've got a lot of young kids out there young aspiring musicians that are looking to get their their same focus they've got ideas what would you say to this next generation that would give them this path of confidence i i I think if it's in you it's going to come out if that if if the focus is in you it's almost as though no one could stop you anyway like nothing i could say could dissuade you nothing anyone could say could dissuade you that was the way it was with me i think in the era we're living in now, the world has sort of shifted a little bit, or maybe a lot, to the kinds of workflows that I was involved in as a kid in the early 80s, you know? 
Yeah. The DIY thing is much more prevalent now. People putting out their own music is much more prevalent now. You know, having the tools to make your own records in a room like this or in your bedroom or, yeah. you know, you don't have to go to a studio anymore. Um, and you uh, you don't have to, you know, wait for the A&R guy to come down to the to the club and discover you and and sign you up to a demo deal or a singles deal or maybe an album deal if you're lucky. Yes, it still happens, but at the same time, there's what, you know, probably 80,000 independent artists uploading their music to Spotify right now, <laughs> today, you know. By the time this interview is over, from the time it started, there will have been probably 20,000 new songs and, <laughs> and, and albums uploaded to all these, these DSPs. So, uh, you know, things have been democratized a great deal for, mm -hmm. for, for better, for worse, whatever. It's just a fact. And... I think now it just comes back to how much do you want it? Because you can upload your music to a DSP. You can um, have a Facebook profile or an Instagram profile or whatever, TikTok. But how much are you gonna how much are you gonna put into getting that record or that social media profile, that name, your name known? How, how are you going to, what are you going to do? How much are you going to dedicate yourself to cutting through the noise? The other 80,000 people that same day who are trying to do the same thing. That's what's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. And I see people who are straight up hustlers, you know, just, I run my own social media, just like I run my business. So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the ads from other people, you know, trying to, trying to do their thing, trying to, you know, get their hustle on as well. There's a certain cream that rises to the top. You can you can see uh, in some of them an extra level of dedication to the craft of making the records, writing the songs, doing the videos, whatever. It may be just a simple performance video, but wow, it's 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 well done, and the song is really good. And they're getting their hustle on. I can tell this this ad was really well constructed. They. You know, they're 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 using their search engine apparatus the right way. They're reaching people who will like their music. I like it. You know, there's an example right there. I like what I just got heard. I never heard of the span five minutes ago, but I like them. That's the era we're living in now. We're living in an era of a lot of people doing a, a self-generated hustle. And it's not easy. It's never supposed to be easy. The people who have what I'm talking about in them who have the innate qualities. If anything, my message to them would just be keep going, keep going. And remember, remember the work is its own reward. Remember right. that it's not just about the likes you might get on your ad or your song or your post. It's about when you're writing that tune that you're now trying to advertise to the public. It's about creating the ad the reward is just in the work of like, could I shave another second off of this 30 second cut down video that I'm going to make into an ad? Like, can I shave another second off and it's just that much stronger? Just that, you know, can I, can I maybe change that ad copy just a little bit? So it's a little more pointed, a little more focused, a little more, whatever, like whatever it needs to be. That's part of the art too. The old days it seems like there were more people who, uh, there were more people involved in the whole process. There was the ad guy, there's the promo guy, there's the radio guy, there's the this guy, the that guy, the, the you know. Now, there's a lot more people who, who have figured out, out of necessity, that you have to be all those guys, yeah. you know. Yeah. Or, or maybe you and, and like a friend, one other person. Right. You've got to put on a lot of hats, wear a lot of different hats. To those people, I would say, um, yeah, just keep remembering that the reward is the work itself. And, and, and one day you'll look back and you'll have 10 years of a body of work that you really like, and then it's going to turn into 20 years. And then it's going to, you know, and, and, and I would also want to uh, dedicate the message to the folks out there who are playing music that isn't as dependent upon physical image and a certain age demographic to those people out there who are, who, who know already that, the best stuff is ageless and timeless, but maybe you're not getting the attention that you would want right now. To those people, I say, just keep going. I'm not sure as much what to say to 
you know, some of the other folks out there who are, you know, maybe doing something that's a little more image driven yeah. or a little more, you know, geared toward um, complying with the, the trends of now, you know, I was never that person in the eighties. I wasn't that person. I'm not going to be that person now. You clearly are not that person. <laughs> but but to the but to the folks who are like minded who 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 would maybe remind me of myself thirty or you know thirty five years ago, I would just say there is a path you can get on it, you can stay on it, and you will reap the rewards of of having stayed that course. You know, you you will reap the rewards of having stayed that course. Boy, that is crystal clear, William. And I'll tell you something, you have definitely separated the wheat. You have then used that to the ingredients to feed people and their soul with your music and your perseverance and your dedication and just your incredible focus on you being you all the time and producing honest music. You have done that and you continue to do it. For that, we thank you so much here in the Artist Series. And I tell you something, I want you to, I wish you the best in the tour that's coming up. Safe travels, you have done fantastic. Your words of wisdom, we, we, I, we, I really want to make sure everybody really takes that in because you really hit some great, great points. And uh, I thank you so much. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me on again. Really, it's an honor. You've done fantastic. Thanks so much. Stay well. And hopefully we'll see you real soon. Thank you, William. Right on, dude. Now I'm Familiar here at the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.